Hi, everybody, and welcome to Tech Tips with the Bearded Photographer. My name is Bo Edestead, and welcome to the series of learning about photography. Now, today, we're going to talk about cameras. By the way, I have lots of kids and family, so you're going to hear that all over the place. So just know that you've been forewarned. <laughs> you made the dive. You decided you wanted to be a photographer. Great for you. You've actually started the process. You've learned a little bit. You've practiced with your phone. You're ready to buy a real big camera. And that's a major purchase. And to be honest with you, that can be a little nerve -ursing. So a couple of things you want to think about before you get a camera. First off, not all cameras are created equally, but they all have something similar. They have to capture a photo using time. They have to control the aperture. Number three, they have a sensor. And number four is its interface. Okay, so what does that mean? It's very simple, okay? Every single camera are gonna have at least all of those items, if not more. And the reason being is because those are the foundations of photos. And it's been laid down since back to the film ages. They all had to take care of the type of film that they're using, AKA the sensor that we have, the amount of light that was coming down the lens, AKA your shutter speed, and then also how much fog, uh, how much what we call bokeh effect or light that is coming into the lens, which is done by your f-stop. And because of this, now you can actually incorporate these type of decision making processes in your camera. Now, when you decide on a specific camera that you want to get, you have to take in consideration of what you intend to use it for. If you're just going to take photos, then you don't need anything like super, super expensive. In fact, you can do a lot with a 20 megapixel camera. That's right. Megapixels. Should I get big megapixels? Should I not get big megapixels? They're all really just there to capture quality, but uh, you shouldn't go below eight megapixels. I, I, honestly, I wouldn't even go below 12 or even 16 at that matter. And the reason being is because a lot of TVs, a lot of content, and a lot of people that look, they'll zoom in on that photo and they'll see all the pixelization that's happening and it becomes a ah, kind of like a scar on your type of capabilities, if you know what I mean. So <laughs> you want to make sure that your quality is excellent. Another thing also is the sensor size. So, um, you know, when you go smaller on your sensor on in the cameras, it has a hard time catching all the detail and it requires really small lenses and there's not a lot of light that's going to hit it. So one of the things that people forget when it goes into photography and videography is that color is reflection of light. That's right. So color is when the light bounces off of a surface and what we're getting is that color. So the reason why you don't see color when it's a black room so there's got to be light in order to have that. Well, that sensor is in charge of reading and measuring that amount of light. So the larger the sensor, the more light it can sense. Um, but in that same token, you also don't need a massive sensor either. Allow me to explain. It really depends on the glass. And that's kind of where it comes down to choosing your camera too. Do you want a camera that has custom made lenses and requires a special mount or bracket? Or do you want a camera that is going to be versatile and useful? Sorry about my dog. Um, another thing also is the type of sizes that they have for sensors. So they have one, 2.5, which is a half inch sensor. They have a four thirds, which is a micro four thirds um, sensor. They have an APC sensor. They have your 24 millimeter sensor. They have a 35 and then they have a full frame sensor. And now what does that mean? Those are the measurements and the sizes of the sensors. So they go small, they go medium, they go big and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So depending on what you tend to do if you're going to do a lot of night photography, then you're going to need a sensor that's bigger than, you know, a half inch. You're going to want it, you know, four thirds or even bigger. Okay. Um, for night photography, if you're going to be doing a lot of 
video recording and you need a really good stabilization or you're going to do bird and wildlife photography and you need really good stabilization, you need to go for a thirds or bigger. And the reason being is because some of the stabilizing that they use is a software-based stabilization. So rather than moving the sensor around all over the place, it's mainly they just frame down the picture. And then in software, they make sure that everything isn't shaky or blurry or whatever. I'm not a software guy. So that's one of the things you got to be mindful of when looking at a camera. The other thing is budget. Um, usually the bigger frame and uh, ISO image size that you get, the bigger image sensor, the more expensive it is. They get pretty up there. And so you want to look that in consideration. And then the types of glass that you need for it are massive and heavy too. So you got to think about that too. Next is what do you plan on doing with it? Because uh, you can have some cameras that are great for wildlife photography, and you got some cameras that are not good for wildlife photography. And what I mean by that is the, um, the rate that it's able to autofocus, unless you are a manual type of guy and you're going to use a manual focus lens with a manual focus uh, system. If you are doing that and you're doing wildlife photography, hats off to you, bro. You the king, you the king, because that's ex extremely hard to do. But I use manual lenses. Sometimes I use prime lenses. I also have automatic focus prime lenses that I use for photography. And the reason being is because I care about the quality of the glass that I'm using in combination with my camera. Now I use a Lumix G9. Now I love Panasonic's Lumix. They have phenomenal cameras. They have made huge progress in their camera selections. So what does the Lumix G9 have? It has a 20 megapixel sensor on it. It is a micro four thirds. So the lenses aren't huge. It's a smaller sensor compared to some of the other ones, but it's still a decent size sensor. It has dual SD card slots inside of it. It has the capabilities of not doing photography, but also video. Uh, I can do 10 bit log uh, 4K at 30 frames or 24 frames a second. I can do HD log at 24 frames a second at, a, at 140 megabytes. It's just, there's a lot of cool things with that camera can do. It's extremely versatile. So I, I love that. Plus it's budget friendly. I'm talking a thousand dollars and I got a camera, a lens and battery system, basically great camera, great camera overall. Um, I've shot on Canon's I've shot on Sony's I've done Olympus. I've done Leica's I've done all kinds of cameras out there and I've spent a lot of money. I'm going to save you a lot of grief. As long as you focus on those little areas that we covered sensor size, uh, megapixels and the quality of your glass. As long as you focus on those three things and you look at the costs of all those stuff, then you can find the right camera that's perfectly for you. Another thing also important is the camera operator. You got to know how to use the camera. So you might want to practice. You might want to practice on a couple of things. Uh, I might want to go get a buddy and go out and practice some photos, take some shots. I did that for a long time until I got good. And by the way, um, don't go and buy a used camera unless you know the operator and you can guarantee that's backed up with some kind of warranty or something like that because some camera operators have done some shady stuff with their cameras and that can become a problem when you go to try to operate it and it's starting to glitch or give you some kind of weird thing so just be mindful of that lastly but not leastly one last tech tip i can give you guys for this series is do the research okay compare photos um you know you can find sample photos from the main manufacturer don't believe those don't believe those at all okay um that was done in a studio environment or that was done in real life go on instagram or go on pinterest or go on google or even this channel youtube and look at some of the photos and some of the repercussions and replications that those cameras were able to make and compare them, okay? Compare a full sensor size, Sony A7 Mark III to a Lumix G9 4 3rd sensor or APC sensor for that matter. Compare the contrast, the darks, the lights, the shadows, uh, the sharpness that comes from it. Because you know what? 
I can tell you this right now, a Sony can create some really clean, sharp looking photos, but their darks are so dark and there's the light is so harsh on some of them. And then you go to like an Olympus and they, and that kind of camera, and it's just like the well, Holy grail, you know, and it gets these awesome photos, but then you lose it with some of your shadows and some of your darkness and then the colors aren't popping. Then you go to like a Lumix. And then it's like, man, I could really customize this and tailor this according to what I do. That looks really sharp and clean. And then all of a sudden, you notice that there's some more air. Which what that is, is like, it's like, it's not like just perfect square pixels. It's not exactly perfectly sharp. There's a little bit of a blur here and there. And that that's just adds that patina to that photo or that video that you have in there. And then you can go straight into like a Canon where everything feels warm and elegant and beautiful colors and stuff like that but but then you're like man i don't want that style though i want to kind of kind of adjust it a little bit have more control of the color and those type of things well you're not going to get that in the canon i'm part i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm not going to get a lot of hate for that but but that it's true it's true I, i've shot so many of them and i've even had the esor 5 <sighs> trying to get the colors to match up pain unless you're shooting with a bunch of other cannons that leads to the last tech tip if you plan on having lots of different camera bodies and stuff, then you're going to need to get one that is consistent and works with the others. That's the reason why I chose Panasonic, because the Lumix G7, its color palette can match the exact same of a Lumix G9 or even the G9 Mark II. Or how about we just blow it up and go straight to their premium full sensor editions and go to like a Lumix S5. So this just they they all work with each other one of the things you got to remember about the brand history is also what their name brand means when they put their seal and their stamp on it it's because it's met their mission goal and so if you're going to buy a sony you know you're going to get a quality sensor a quality piece of device if you buy a canon you know you're going to get a quality camera backed up by a lot of people you're going to buy a panasonic it's been in business for God knows how long, just a long time. And you're going to get a quality camera that does what it needs to do. And then what if you wanted to get, um, I don't know, like a Leica. Dude, they were the ones who basically invented the 24 and the 35 millimeter film cameras. Just saying. Uh, they're they're insane. Um, so you can go there. Uh, you want to go to Olympus. They've been in the movie industries longer than I've been born, which is a long time. I'm showing off my age now. Just remember, don't go for those Chinese brands. Do not go for those chunky Amazon and wish.com. You will regret it so much. So get a real camera. That's everything. That's my wrap up. That's my two cents on this for this take today. Like the channel, subscribe, share with your friends, comment below on something else that you want me to talk about. And I'll give you my two cents on it. And perhaps you'll learn something as well.